Do it. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you again to the Society for the opportunity to make this presentation. And just on Joe's very last point, and the current issue of the European Journal of Cardiothoracic Surgery is an analysis from Paul Sergeant's group showing that the benefit of bilateral mammaries does extend in, even in patients who are over 80 years of age. And of course, you can use them as part of a no-touch aortic technique. Anyway, I've been asked to address should the radial artery be preferred to a second IMA. I have no conflicts of interest uh, relevant to this talk. So if we ask the simple question, is there evidence of what, whether the REMA or the RA are better than each other? The simple answer is no, because there are no randomized trials to tell us. There's one very small randomized trial which we'll discuss, but it doesn't have enough patients and it's got a short follow-up. So what other evidence can we use to try and answer this question? Well, some evidence we have that is very hard is angiographic evidence. So we can look at the patency of both bilateral IMAs and radial arteries, mainly in comparison to vein grafts. We can then look at what is the best clinical evidence for survival benefit of either BEMA or radial artery. We'll then look to see what comparisons there have been of REMA versus radial artery and the inherent weaknesses in those studies. And then finally, the question, are there any occasions when the radial artery might possibly be pre preferable to the right internal mammary artery? If we look at the morphology of IMA's radial arteries and saphenous vein grafts, they're all very different. The IMA's main difference morphologically is it has a thin, smooth muscle media and a tight internal elastic lamina. But physiologically far more important than this is the internal mammary artery produces far more nitric oxide in both basal and stimulated states than either the radial artery or the saphenous vein graft. And the benefits of nitric oxide in the coronary circulation have been demonstrated repeatedly over the last three and four decades. Let's first look about angiographic patency of bilateral IMA grafts when placed to the left-sided coronaries. There's actually a lot of angiographic studies with follow-up from seven days to 10 years. And you can see out to 10 years, the patency of both mammary arteries remains at least 90%, often closer to 95%. We can therefore definitely say from this data, both IMA have similar patency when used to the left-sided coronary arteries, and both IMA have similar patencies when used as inside your grafts or used as composite grafts to each other. But there is good evidence in the literature that if you anastomose an IMA to the aorta, rather than to the other internal mammary artery, you will drop its patency by about 20%. If you look at the best data on the use of a second, the right internal mammary artery out to 20 years, this is by Tatulis and Buxton's group. The top graph shows the patency of the lima and the rima out to 10 years. When placed to the LED, they're both 95% at 10 years. There is no vein graft that has been demonstrated to have this kind of patency at a decade of follow-up. The second graph shows the patency of both REMA or LIMA placed to the circumflex system. You can see they're identical at 10 years, but they're only 90%, so slightly lower than the 95% for the LED, but still superbly, or still much superior to anything that's ever been seen with vein grafts. And in the patients they followed out to 20 years with the right internal mammary artery, the right internal mammary artery, the patency remained at over 90% at 20 years of follow-up. So we simply do not see this kind of data with any other conduit. Now let's turn to what we know about the radial artery. That if you look at the patency of a radial artery at one year in comparison to vein grafts, five randomized trials, almost 1,000 patients, at one year, the angiographic failure of radial artery was 14%, and the angiographic failure of saphenous vein was also 14%. So good evidence at one year follow-up, no difference between radial arteries and saphenous veins. If you look at this analysis, however, looking at what happens as you follow these patients out to and beyond five years, you see that the failure rate of of the saphenous veins increases to almost threefold that of radial arteries by the time you're at five years. The individual single most definitive trial is the five-year follow-up of the RAPS trial by Steve Freem's group. They looked at 510 patients. The patients were randomized to radial artery or saphenous veins where they acted as their own control. 
So if you had a radial artery to the right, you would get saphenous vein to the circumflex and vice versa. They looked at 269 patients and geography at a mean of seven years. The graft occlusion rate was 9% for the radial artery and 18% for the saphenous vein and functional graft occlusion 12% and 20% respectively. So I don't think there is any argument whatsoever. Is there, does a radial artery have superior patency to saphenous veins when you get past out to five years? The answer is definitely yes. And this is a network meta-analysis by Umberto Benedetto, who currently works with me in Oxford. And again, this shows again that the as you follow patients out beyond one year, out to five years, the patency of radial arteries is superior to that of saphenous vein. And here's one of the longest follow-up angiographic studies of radial artery. So they, these authors looked at seven-year angiography of radial artery, lima, rima, free IMA, and saphenous vein. And if we start with the lima, the seven-year patency was 96%. The seven-year patency of the radial artery, 83%. Now, unfortunately, they had relatively few remas and free IMAs, only 50 or so patients. But these, so it's, it's really, too, you can't conclude much about that. But where they did have significant numbers of patients, the radial artery remained, I'm, I'm sorry, the lima was superior patency to the radial artery. So what, how do we try and move this forward? This is the ART trial, so I, we, I'm going to turn to some clinical results. This was 3,000 patients we randomized to single or bilateral IMA grafts. We used 67 surgeons, 28 centers, seven countries. And the key thing to note here is the 30-day mortality was 1.2% and the one-year mortality 2.4%. And the one-year incidence of stroke, MI, and repeat revascularization all under 2%. Now we had planned to published an interim analysis of the five-year outcomes in 2014. Unfortunately, the trial center conducting the study, the Brompton, the trials unit was closed down and everything's had to be transferred to Oxford University. So it's delayed things by about a year and a half, but this, this will be produced. In the absence of anything else just now, what do we know? Well, back in 2001, we published this meta-analysis in The Lancet, looking at 4,500 BEMA versus 11,000 SEMA. These patients were not randomized, but they were matched for age, gender, LV function, and diabetes. And what we found was that the hazard ratio for death with bilateral IMA grafts was 0 0.8, which translates into a number needed to treat of approximately 13 to 16 patients to one extra survivor. In circulation in 2014, we updated this with now 16,000 patients with single or bilateral IMA grafts, but crucially followed for at least nine years. So this is the longest follow-up of such a large cohort of patients with single and bilateral IMA grafts, and again showed a convincing reduction in the hazard ratio for death with bilateral IMA grafts. But the harsh fact is that still today, fewer than 10% of patients in Europe and fewer than 5% in the United States undergoing cabbage actually get BEMA grafts. Now, we've heard a lot about the potential downside of BEMA. So it does not increase your one-year mortality or major morbidity, with the exception of the, an increased risk of sternal wound reconstruction. In the ART trial, this was 0.6% in patients with single IMA grafts and 1.9% in those with bilateral IMA grafts. So a threefold increase or an absolute difference in increase of 1.3%, which translates into a number needed to harm of almost 80 patients if you use bilateral IMA grafts. However, if you take out the obese diabetics from this, there is virtually no difference between the single and the bilateral IMA groups. And this is an analysis that we're going to uh, speak about at the AATS, looking at the effects of skeletonization or pedicled harvesting of the IMA grafts. Now, if you look at a skeletonized SEMA, it has a significantly lower risk of wound infection than a pedicled single internal mammary artery. And if you look at the third, which is bilateral IMA skeletonized, it has the same instance of wound infection as a single pedicled mammary. And the group who have the highest risk of wound infection are not surprisingly the pedicled bilateral IMA grafts. Quite a striking difference in these. And anyone who does a lot of arterial grafts, the way you start learning it is the first thing you do is you learn to skeletonize one mammary artery, then the other, 
And as Gianni Angelini said, you, it's an incremental process on how to do this. So there's, what do we know for definite evidence in terms of comparing radial and artery and rema? Well, there's only been one study, the RAPCO study by Brian Buxton's group, and they looked at two populations. In patients under 70 years of age, patients were randomized in addition to a single mammary artery, either a second mammary artery or a radial artery. And in patients over 70 years, they were randomized to either um, radial artery or saphenous vein. And what they suggested was there might actually be inferior patency of the mammary arteries compared to the radial artery. The problem with this study is twofold. The numbers are very small, and they made the terrible mistake of anastomosing the right mammary arteries to the aorta rather than to the other mammary artery or using them as inside your grafts because it was already clearly established in the literature, as I've said, that if you anastomose a mammary artery to the aorta, you will drop its patency by about 20%. What else do we know about comparisons of, that's the only randomized trial. So what else can we say about comparisons of radial arteries and right internal thoracic arteries? This is a study of propensity match patients, relatively small, only about three, 250 patients in each group, comparing radial artery plus saphenous, I'm sorry, comparing beta and saphenous vein with either a single mammary radial artery and saphenous vein graft. And these authors concluded the results of our study provide strong evidence for the superiority of a right internal thoracic artery graft compared to radial artery as a second conduit. So they came out heavily in favor of the use of a second mammary rather than radial, but again, it's propensity match patients, not a randomized trials. If we look at pe people who are commonly using radial arteries, this group by Tom Schwann and Robert Habib and Robert Trumba, they've published numerous papers on the radial artery, so I don't have time to show them all today, but this is arguably one of their most important, looking at propensity match patients, both in New York and Ohio. The New York group had almost 1,000 pairs, Ohio almost 1,200, and they showed a significant reduction in mortality in propensity match patients with radial arteries. If we look at this paper they've just published from the same group in the European Journal of Cardiothoracic Surgery, the question was, what is the second best arterial graft, a propensity analysis of the radial versus the right internal thoracic artery to the circumflex coronary? And they claimed to show a better outcome with a radial artery rather than a right internal thoracic artery. The real regret about this is, unfortunately, like the Brian Buxton's group, they used the right internal thoracic artery as a free graft from the aorta. And I've repeatedly said that has been shown in the literature to drop patencies of the right internal thoracic artery. So this is a bad comparison. Had the anastomosed the right internal thoracic artery to the left internal thoracic artery, this would have been a much more useful study. Or if they'd used the right internal thoracic artery as an inside your graft. These were also done two different hospitals by different surgeons using tech, different techniques. And the other key thing was the IMA were harvested as pedicles rather than skeletonized grafts. What about patients with diabetes? Well, this is again from the same group, Robert Tronba again. And what they looked at was what was the morbidity in patients receiving either a second thoracic artery or a radial artery. So they looked at a relatively small number of patients, 202 in each group after propensity matching. And the results I found difficult to understand. So they said that the use of a second internal thoracic artery significantly increased your risk of stroke. Now that, I presume, was the amount of aortic manipulation needed to try and anastomose a mammary artery to the aorta. However, what they did show was that there was a significant reduction in the risk of sternal wound infection with the use of radial rather than um, second mammary artery, and a significant reduction in the incidence of respiratory failure. And anyone using bilateral mammary arteries frequently, the groups you do avoid, we've already said the obese diabetics, the other group to avoid are those with bad lungs, because any patient who requires prolonged ventilation with two mammary arteries is at significant risk of sternal wound dehiscence. So how do we summarize and conclude? There's strong angiographic evidence of superior patency of both internal mammary arteries and the radial artery versus saphenous grain. 
this afternoon's vein. And I think the best angiographic evidence we have just now shows superior patency rates of the internal mammary artery versus the radial artery. And it seems to increase with the further, with increasing duration of follow-up. If you look at clinical evidence, there's strong evidence of improved survival with BEMA over saphenous veins, and there's also strong evidence of improved survival with radial artery versus saphenous vein. There's only been one small randomized trial comparing radial artery versus REMA, but unfortunately the REMA was anastomosed to the aorta, so the use of it was suboptimal. And there have been two propensity match studies, one claiming favor of the second mammary artery over the radial artery and the other claiming better radial artery over rema. So what I would say is the problem with these, the big studies that have used remas have the anastomose to the aorta rather than using as in situ or composite grafts from the other internal mammary artery. So the best evidence still supports rema is the second best arterial graft. For BEMA, you, they should be avoided in obese diabetic patients, and when you're using them, they should be taken as skeletonized grafts. But there is no question that the radial artery is a good alternative as a second arterial conduit when there are contraindications to the use of the BEMA. And the final thing I'll say is in August the 21st to 23rd, we're going to run, I'm going to run this course with John Puskas in New York, where it's a three-day course simply on every single aspect of arterial revascularization you can think of. On that point, I'm going to conclude my talk I'd like to thank the society again for the opportunity to be here and to make this presentation and you, the audience, for your attention. Thank you.